Friends of God, welcome to worship today. This is the day that our God has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Our help and our hope, our sustenance and our strength is in the name of the triune God, Creator, Christ, and Holy Spirit. We always say these words as we enter God's sanctuary, but sometimes collectively, even nationally, stating our need for God to guide us is particularly important. So let me say it again. Our help is in the name of God, maker, redeemer, sustainer of heaven and earth. Come, let us worship our God with these sentences taken from Psalm 100. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship God with gladness. Come into God's presence with singing. Know that the Lord is God. It, it is God that made us, and we belong to God. We are God's people and the sheep of God's pasture. We come into God's presence singing. Come into God's presence singing. We come into God's presence singing. Alleluia. We Enter God's gates with thanksgiving. We will enter God's gates with thanksgiving and God's courts with praise. We will give thanks to God and bless God's name. We come into your presence singing. We come into your presence singing. We come into your presence singing. Hallelujah. God greeting you today. Grace to you and peace. I am here. I am with you always. I have come that you may have life and life in abundance. Amen. Amen. Friends, let us join the gospel choir as together we praise our God of love and life.
plenty of fruit in your harvest for every Friends, when you've been far from home, are you able to remember what it was like? Do you yearn for return? Some homes are places of pain, and leaving is necessary and important, and final. But other homes are really wonderful places, and circumstances of social change, climate change, career change, an incident of growth, or an incident of pain can pull us away. The Bible is full of stories of people who find themselves away from home and who desire a return. We think of the Israelites forcibly removed from their land and taken to Babylon. We think of Joseph forcibly removed from his family by jealous brothers and sold into slavery. We think of Ruth and her family building a life in Moab. We think of Mary and Joseph and Jesus retreating quickly because of a dangerous Herod. In all these cases, there are stories of joyful lives built in faraway lands, and there is the story of desiring home, or remembering home, or trying to build home on the road, trying to return home. Where is home? Can we have two homes? The refugee and immigration stories told in this church deepen our connection to this topic. And now, with this pandemic, and with the multiple layers of systemic racial violence unveiled for all to see, we again ask questions about the United States as home. Is this our home? Is it home for all of us? Or just for some? What would it take for the United States to feel like home? A place for safety and rest and growth and beauty and life for all of us. Let us pray. God, home is where we, know we are most alive. Home is where we feel safe. Home is where our deepest relationships flourish. Home is where we grow and come to know ourselves as loved deeply. God, we can have more than one home, and we know you want each place where you plant us to become home. God, this home that we have here in the United States does not feel like a safe home at this moment. 
It feels like a home that is falling apart. Help us, we pray, to look to you to build this home again, to call the family back together, this time in ways that look like a household of equality, safety, and love. Galilee was starting to feel like it wasn't their home. Though born there, the military police were making life untenable for Galileans. Though they raised their children there, it was now hard to find work, hard to get health care, and hard to find food. It wasn't hard to see food being produced and packaged. Fish and grain from Galilee were abundant, but as an export. Food in the shipping containers leaving the land to feed the Roman military and far off wealthy communities. The Galilean home was under stress. And then Jesus came and cared about making communities just and making communities into beautiful homes again. Hear these words from Matthew 9. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Friends of God, hear the good news. In Christ Jesus, God showed radical compassion for us as we live out our days on this earth. Christ sought to create homes and to save us from harassment and helplessness. Thanks be to God. Amen. Cleft for me, let me hide myself in thee. Let the water in the flood from thy wounded sides flow. Be a sin, the double pure, save from wrath. Of my hands, 
Friends, Scripture reminds us of our broken world and promises us a savior of return and healing and home. Scripture too calls us to participate with God in renewal. As people made new, what does God require of us? God told Micah the prophet, and God tells us to seek justice, love kindness, and to walk humbly with God. That's what can make this planet or communities home again. What does the As people freed from the bondage of sin and death, assured of homecoming, let's live as people who have woken up to God's new day.
The memory verse this month of June comes from Romans 6.11. You must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Friends, let's pass the peace of Christ to one another. If you're watching this online and want to share a comment or text or email someone to share Christ's peace with other members of our community and share the peace of Christ with those that you are together with in your household. Also today, we will be celebrating our healing liturgy later in the service. So if you'd like to get some kind of an oil to participate in the healing liturgy, we encourage you to do that now as well. Peace of Christ be with you. We will seek you first, Lord. You will hear our voices early in the morning and late in the night. We will sing your praises, giving you the glory, offering our lives to you, a holy sacrifice. May our praises rise as it sets, O oh Lord. Friends of God, it has been beautiful to approach God together, and um, please join me now as we turn to God in prayer. God, thank you that in this place we've, we've come and asked to be made new, and we've received word from you that it's true, that it can happen, and that you've already given us guidance for how to live in the world. And I pray that all that preparation has made us ready to hear a fresh word from you. And may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The scripture lesson today is Matthew 9.35 to 10.8. Listen for the word of God speaking to you. Then Jesus went all about the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned the 12 disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and every sickness. These are the names of the 12 disciples. First, 
Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the Cananean, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles, and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. The word of God. Thanks be to God. My sermon title today is Taking a Knee and Saying Black Lives Matter is Just the Start. Friends of God, in recent weeks, our eyes have opened wide to images of Americans marching in the streets, kneeling in the square, gathering in masses seeing tens of thousands together kneeling and seeing people like Speaker Nancy Pelosi and Senators Booker and Schumer taking a knee in the Capitol, this all means something. And seeing hundreds of you, members of RCHP, joining a thousand plus at the Highland Park High School, that means a lot too. The death of George Floyd, murdered in broad daylight by a police officer, right on the heels of other horrific deaths of black Americans by people in power, has the nation erupting, and it should. Enough is enough. It's time to check systemic racism at the door. I watched, actually choking back tears a couple of days ago, as Roger Goodell, the commissioner for the National Football League, gave a public apology for the NFL's failure to support and appreciate the prophetic power of black players who peacefully protested the brutality against black Americans by taking a knee during the national anthem. He didn't name former 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick, and he should have, but I did hear Goodell's apology as sincere, and I heard a promise to do better. Quote, we, the National Football League, condemn racism and the systematic oppression of black people. We, the National Football League, admit we were wrong for not listening to NFL players earlier and we encourage all to speak out and peacefully protest. We, the National Football League, believe Black Lives Matter. I partially choked back tears because I, like so many Americans, am guilty of not following Kaepernick's lead. I was impressed by Kaepernick's genuine prophetic action offered in 2016, but despite the fact that his peaceful protesting completely blocked him from being a player in the league, I have gone back to watching football and not remained attentive to Kaepernick's plea. The prophet Kaepernick endured lots of hate-filled threats and lost the best years of his professional career. And America went back to its unfettered celebration of nationalism and football without working on meaningful reform to address the racism that Kaepernick was highlighting. I quote him from 2016, I'm not going to stand up to show pride in a flag for a country that oppresses black people and people of color. To me, this is bigger than football, and it would be selfish on my part to look the other way. There are bodies in the street and people getting paid leave and getting away with murder, unquote. I, though impressed by his kneeling and supportive of it, of course, hardly took a knee myself, if I am honest, and definitely didn't do the follow-up work that he was really asking for. He was asking for the kingdom of God for black people. He was asking that we say collectively, black lives matter and that we live into it. Friends of God, if we take the knee now in 2020, if we say black lives matter with our lips, then it better lead to action. Today's passage comes from Matthew's gospel, chapter nine and a little bit of 10. And let me quickly put that in context. Matthew 5 through 7 is Jesus' presentation that we call the Sermon on the Mount. And it's Jesus' inaugural sermon. 
In it, Jesus laid out the blueprint for the kingdom of God that he was announcing was on its way in. He starts off the sermon with a list of blessed are you statements that clearly say blessed are the last starting now. Those who've been wronged will be treated right. Those who mourn will be comforted by the community. Those without land will inherit it. Those who are excluded will become the included. And his sermon goes on to say that those who are in positions to stand up for this new way of life, to push for these new equities, need to do so and need to be ready to face persecution for their adherence to the way of justice and peace. Blessed are you when they persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you, for they did the same to the prophets says Jesus. Again, this sermon is about what was about to unfold and to be seen in Jesus' work immediately. It describes a heaven-like last or first kingdom that Jesus promised to usher in, or at least to begin, through the ministry that he was just starting to embody. Jesus came down the mountain after delivering that sermon and in chapters 8 and 9 started living the sermon that he just preached. We hear of him stopping in villages to heal the sick, bring recovery to the paralytic. We hear of him listening to the oppressed and driving out demons from those who are possessed. In the first verses that Selma read for us today, Jesus seemed to be able to do it all, traveling to all villages, we are told, teaching and proclaiming and healing every disease and every sickness, the text says. Doing it all. But then just as soon as the words all and every get out of the narrator's mouth, we learn that many are not being healed and restored by Jesus. Jesus, from this strong place of modeling the new kingdom, from this place of offering healing and freedom, looked out upon the crowds in Galilee and saw a people, as the text says, harassed and helpless. Or as I prefer the translation, harassed and worn out. It seems to me that right about then, Jesus took a knee, if you will, in Galilee. Acknowledging the brokenness of the world, acknowledging the pain present in it, acknowledging the harassment of Galilean Jews at the hands of Rome's global dominance, Jesus took a knee and contemplated all that was wrong. Jesus took a knee, and I bet he spoke to God while he was down there on his knee, thinking of the harassment that people had endured. He was down there on his knee considering the ways that the U.S. and New Jersey, through its criminal justice systems, disproportionately sent its people based on race. He was down there on his knee considering the ways that slavery was met not with apology and reparations, but rather with new forms of chains that came first in the form of Jim Crow, but also in so many other subtle and not so subtle forms of segregation. Christ Jesus was down there on his knee seeing the way that marijuana charges fill our jails with black youth. He was down there on his knee considering the way that educational tracking in public school can set you up for failure or liberty. He was down there on his knee thinking about the lack of child care for poor families. Down there on one knee thinking about police brutality and profiling and the gap in family wealth and the unequal access to health, he was down there on his knee seeing how many black people were dying of COVID-19 in prison. He looked out on a people harassed and tired. And then he got up and continued the work in Galilee and in our Galilee, but he did not get up to do it alone, for there were too many in need and too many systems of powers that needed to be undone. Today, Selma read a bit of chapter 9 and 10, which is really stuff that's very early in Jesus' healing ministry. He's still naming his disciples here. And already, even as he's just beginning to name them, Jesus starts to share leadership with them. Here at the end of chapter 9 and beginning of 10, Jesus refers to the same 12 people by two different names. He calls them disciples, students, and apostles, which means sent ones. And this is right, for they were both of those things. They take in his teachings and instructions, which makes them disciples or students, and then almost immediately they're sent out into the world as apostolos, into the harvest to share what they've learned, for there's no time to lose. You'd think that maybe as disciples, Jesus would have given them more time to observe his work before sending them out on an assignment, but no. 
Jesus transformed his disciple team into his apostle team so quickly. It didn't take Jesus too long in his direct engagement in community work to be struck by the size and scope of the problems in Galilee. He looked out on the crowds and he said, in effect, we can't wait. I can't take four years to get my disciples a degree in community action and grassroots organizing. I can't put them through the program on public health and safety. I've got to send them out now. They'll keep learning from me as we go because I'll be with them. But I've got to send them now. Look at the crowds. Let me say it again. Jesus got up and asked his disciples to go from being followers to being sent ones from him, sent into the community. Get off your knee, disciples, and with me get to work. There was no time to lose. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers few. What is the harvest? There are lots of biblical references to the harvest. I mean, does it mean it's time to gather in people like wheat gathered at the harvest? For what? Gather people in for the new community of the kingdom? Probably, or at least maybe. Or does it mean that the wheat and tares have been growing up together? Is it time for Jesus and the apostles to separate out the wheat from the tares and burn up the tares of systemic oppression? Probably that too. Or could Jesus actually be talking about real wheat here? Might it be that laborers are to collect the wheat, the bounty of the earth, the resources of the world, and distribute them fairly? Grain was being stolen. Could it be that part of Jesus' message to apostles was protect the resources of this earth, the wheat and such, for the new kingdom community? Harvest language often comes up in apocalyptic end-time writing. Harvest time suggests a reckoning, a seasonal change. Apostles get out there into this day of reckoning, bringing the message of black lives matter to the kingdom of God. This is the harvest. To march is to kneel. To march and to kneel is to participate in a swell of outrage at the harassment and to pause and look upon it in grief or rage. To be an apostle is to take the next step, to agree to participate in the harvesting, willing to do the hard work, willing to learn and unlearn things, willing to take risks, willing to craft policies and challenge powers. And harvesting, when it comes to Black Lives Matter, isn't about slow change. It's about seismic change. It's about abolishing things. It's apocalyptic. And I'll borrow words from New Jersey pastor and prophet in my mind, Reverend Charles Boyer, and from his organization, Salvation and Social Justice. The prophetic call of our ancestors did not say, sorry, did not call for slavery or Jim Crow reform, but rather for abolition. And we must abolish youth prisons. We must abolish the drug war and abolish mass incarceration. We must abolish police brutality. We must abolish school and housing segregation concentrated poverty harvest language when it comes to black lives matter is abolition uh, abolishment language and and harvest language is restorative language we must create restorative alternatives to policing and incarceration we must create affordable housing and health care for all and real economic and political opportunities we must Jesus summoned the twelve and gave authority to abolish and restore as they went forth as apostles. And Jesus summons you, each of you, you of every color and race, every gender and age, every profession. Jesus summons you, every follower of Christ, and asks you, once you've taken a knee long enough to truly acknowledge our nation's original sin and all the sinful spin-offs therein, to dust off your knee. Dust off your knee where you've been kneeling with Jesus, looking at it, a harassed and tired black America. Dust off your knee and become an apostle. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let us pray. God, we thank you for all of the prophets of now. Colin Kaepernick, Reverend Boyer, 
all the prophets. We thank you for all those who've suffered unjustly, whose deaths we would pray be undone, but whose deaths are symbolically now prophetic and leading us to a new day. May we be a people who actually accept the gift that you give all your disciples, which is to really live for the kingdom of God. In your name we pray. Amen. Let's now prepare to give of our tithes and offerings. And if you haven't done so before, you can go to our church website, www.rchighlandpark.org, uh, to give online. You can also send checks to 19 South 2nd Avenue in Highland Park.
Let's pray. God, thank you for all the ways you are bringing us home and for the ways that you are reshaping our home. May these offerings that we bring today help us as a church to further be a mechanism to help restore the homes of all who live within the region where you've planted us. And we know, oh God, that monetor monetary donations are just a part of what we offer. We offer our time to others in need. We offer rides to those who need transportation. We read to those who need help with that. We offer food to those who are hungry. We offer legislation for those who need protection under the law. What is in the plates is just the first fruits, a symbolic act of what we will give to you this week until we gather again. Amen. Friends, we respond with tithes and offerings, and as Amos said in that prayer, with so much more. A couple of ways you can contribute this week would be to engage legislatively. Um, just today, Amos sent out a newsletter that tells how you can help with an assembly and Senate bill that would help um, folks who are at risk of COVID in New Jersey's prisons to get um, special time toward early release um, for having been in the prison during this COVID period. It's a very important legislation that could save lives, both for those who are being released a little early and for the prison population that stays inside but now has a chance to actually be more properly distanced. I wanted to also say that there has been a letter sent from the church calling for the reduction of the militarization of policing. So that's something that we have worked on this week as a Justice and Mercy Committee. So just, um, you can pray about that and you can go to Faith in New Jersey's website to learn more about their work on that matter. Also, the church is thankful for the Loose Foundation contribution that's allowed us to help many new families um, get housing. So I can tell you that as of today, we have rented nine new apartments in the last month that have helped families get out of domestic violence shelters and out of um, hotels and out of their cars and in other places and out of uh, immigration detention as well as halfway houses. So we're so thankful for the chance to serve in this way with that special grant that the church was given. Thanks be to God. One last announcement is that um, we will soon be meeting again in person, and the details of that are still to come, but we do ask that you pay attention to your newsletters this week. Um, the governor came out with new guidelines for gatherings, and 100 people can gather together in outdoor spaces, so that will play a part in the decisions that we make um, coming fairly soon, though we're not sure exactly what it will look like. We now turn our attention to healing. Our God is a healing God. When Christ arrived, he came casting out demons and healing diseases. He touched the wounds of the world and allowed people a chance to come home, made new. Let us, recipients of the Spirit of God and disciples called by Christ, Participate in healing and homecoming, too. Perhaps today you need healing. Perhaps today you can offer it to another. This is the place where we both give and receive. Is anyone among you suffering? Let them pray. Is anyone among you cheerful? Let them sing praise. Is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church and let them pray over you, anointing with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the sick person and the Lord will raise you up. And if you've committed sins, you'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous has great power. Let us join together in the intercession for healing and wholeness. O oh God, the creator, whose will for us and for all your people is health and salvation, have mercy on us and hear our prayer. O oh God, the Christ, who came that we might have life and have it in abundance, 
Have mercy on us and hear our prayer. O God, the Holy Spirit, whose indwelling makes our bodies the temples of your presence, have mercy on us and hear our prayer. O gracious God, we come together in this silence and we name aloud the people in our lives who need your healing touch. If we're by ourselves at home, we name them even aloud to you, O God. We trust, O Lord, that you will come beside those we love and those we pray for, and that you'll comfort them and heal their bodies and spirits. O gracious God, in Jesus, you called us out of the darkness and into your marvelous light. Enable us always to declare your wondrous deeds. We thank you for your steadfast love. We praise you with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together over the oils of healing. Come, Spirit of the Living One, bless this oil of anointing. Make it an oil of gladness and of healing and a lotion of strength and tenderness. Amen. In the name of our Savior Jesus Christ, who sends forth disciples to preach the kingdom of God and to heal, we invite all who wish to receive the laying on of hands and the anointing with oil to participate in the healing liturgy today.
May God bless you and keep you. May God's face shine upon you and grant you peace this day and forevermore. Go in peace to love and to serve. Amen.